Caroline Weber is an associate professor of French at Barnard College and Columbia University. She's a specialist in 18th century French literature, culture, and history. She's also taught at the University of Pennsylvania and at Yale. Her other publications include Terror and Its Discontents, a well-received and widely taught book on the reign of the terror, an edited volume of French Yale, Yale French Studies, and numerous articles. She lives with her husband in New York City, and she's been very gracious to come down to Atlanta when she's been very busy this week doing all kinds of other things. So please welcome Caroline Weber. Thank you so much uh, to Virginia Shear and Ashley Toddy and all their colleagues at Baha'i for this really generous invitation for the lovely introduction and for bringing you out here today to, uh, to listen to me talk a little bit about what Marie Antoinette wore to the revolution. It's, it's a delight to be here. Um, so I wanted to start with this contemporary image of a, a Marie Antoinette dress that was designed by John Galliano for Christian Dior in the fall of 2000, conveniently right around the time I was starting to do research for this book. And one of the things that really strikes me about this image now and that, that will serve as the starting point for my discussion today uh, is the fact that Galliano seems to imply with these two embroidered portraits of Marie Antoinette that unfortunately don't come up altogether clear on the slide, uh, Galliano seems to imply that there's a direct link between the kinds of excessive fashion statements Marie Antoinette made during her lifetime and the sort of political trouble she got herself into at the ending. I don't want to spoil, um, spoil the suspense for anybody, but Marie Antoinette did wind up being guillotined, as, as surely most of you know. And, um, Looking more closely at these two portraits, what's so fascinating to me, the one on, on my right, of course, is Marie Antoinette trudging to the guillotine in, in a raggedy dress and in the, uh, the red drooping bonnet of liberty, which was the emblem of her revolutionary antagonists. It was a symbol of uh, freedom from, from royal slavery that the revolutionaries adopted to, uh, to distance themselves from and establish themselves as enemies of the crown. Um, so Marie Antoinette, obviously on the right, in, in a lot of trouble, going to her famous beheading. But what was so interesting to me, the more I learned about what Marie Antoinette wore during her lifetime, about this other portrait, is the way it actually condenses two very different sorts of uh, fashion preferences that Marie Antoinette espoused during her life. Uh, the first was the, um, the famous towering three-foot-high hairdo known as the poof, which is still more or less synonymous with her name, and which, in fact, we see echoed on the, the model herself as wearing kind of one of those towering wedding cake hairstyles that Marie Antoinette very much brought into vogue in France in the 1770s. Uh, but the second thing was, was an, um, on the bottom half of the portrait, in terms of what Marie Antoinette is wearing on her body, is something very different and something that Marie Antoinette actually herself adopted as a reaction against the ostentatious, over-the-top look of the poof. Uh, and this was much, much more something she wore a decade later in the 1780s, which was the infamous shepherdess dress, the chemise dress, distinctly unroyal, distinctly modern, distinctly not like anything that any other French queen had ever worn before. This was another look that Marie Antoinette brought very much into style, but which got her in um, a huge amount of scandal with the French public who didn't expect to see their queen dressed in this way. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is really a, a kind of a twofold, a twofold story. The first is how and why Marie Antoinette revolutionized French fashion by going to two extremes, both extremely overdressed with the poof and extremely scandalously casually underdressed with the chemise. Uh, secondly, I wanted to talk about how um, how that, uh, what the ramifications of that, what her, her companions and her, her contemporaries called this revolution in dress, how that affected both French pol politics and French fashion as it was then and as we even know it today. So both the politics of Marie Antoinette's clothing choices and their impact on the fashion industry and how those things uh, remain with us, whether or not we're aware of it, even today. Um, so to, to get started for a little bit of background for those of you who aren't Marie Antoinette buffs or who haven't already read my book, Marie Antoinette was married off at the age of 14 years old to the future king, Louis XVI of France. 
The marriage was contracted in 1770, um, and it was really designed to reverse an ages-old enmity between Marie Antoinette's native Austria, she was a princess of the House of Habsburg, and the House of Bourbon in France. The countries had been warring enemies for centuries, and with this new dynastic alliance, the two countries hoped to establish a new, uh, a, a new diplomatic rapprochement in Europe for their mutual security and strength. Uh, to that end, Marie Antoinette was told from the moment she was tapped to marry uh, into this illustrious French family, she was told that she would really have one job to perform above all others, and that would be to look the part of the, uh, of the perfect Bourbon princess. And I'm going to switch slides now to show you what she was expected to look like by the time she got to Versailles. This is an idealized portrait from the early 1770s, um, not one done from life, but really more reflecting what the sartorial ideal was for a woman in her station. Uh, at the court of Versailles, since the 17th century, when Louis XIV had famously consolidated his power, brought all of his nobles to heel, and forced them all essentially to live under his gilded roof at this an immense, enormous palace, um, fashion, royal fashion, was, was viewed as an expression of royal might, splendor, and power. Louis XIV, the Sun King, had codified the ways in which he, his family members, and his courtiers were to dress, and their outfits were all meant to express and make visible quite easily and immediately to anybody passing by what their status was in the very complicated hierarchy of Versailles. So as a future queen of France, and um, when Marie Antoinette was married off to the future king, the, uh, the pre her predecessor, Queen Maria Lachinska, had already died in 1768, so Marie Antoinette was to be the highest ranking woman at Versailles, and as such, she was expected to wear very grand, very ceremonial clothing on a daily basis. Uh, the, uh, this this costume consisted in, and this is as grand and ceremonial as it gets, this was called the grand habit de cour, the, the great court outfit, uh, but this was pretty much something Marie Antoinette was expected to wear quite often at court, um, composed of thick layers of French-made lace sleeves, a very stiff uh, stomacher or bodice that was uh, underlaid with an incredibly tightly uh, boned whalebone corset that apparently caused fainting, dizziness, uh, bad breath, and asthma attacks among the women who were required to wear them. Um, and uh, long, long train, very heavy and difficult to maneuver, uh, very wide hoop skirts or panniers that were essentially baskets that were attached to the woman's frame underneath her dress. And this form, this shape, this style of dress was meant to express and communicate royal splendor and might. And that was the bottom line. So Marie Antoinette, who had grown up in the Austrian Habsburg court, where such costumes as this were really only worn on very rare state occasions, Marie Antoinette had to be trained, even before she left Vienna, in the ways of French dress and French elegance. Uh, to that end, she underwent what our, our modern TV producers would call an extreme makeover of, of the most extensive proportions. Uh, it was deemed by a visiting delegation of French diplomats from Versailles who were there to kind of check her out and make sure that she would cut the mustard at Versailles. It was deemed that her hair, her teeth, her body, and her wardrobe all needed fixing. And this was when she was only 13 years old. So the hair was pretty easy to fix. Um, if you look at before, before a, um, the queen's personal, the late queen's personal hairdresser from Paris uh, was sent off to Vienna to help fix Marie Antoinette's hair, her hair was more or less worn naturally, unpowdered, kind of frizzy, and apparently usually pulled back from her head in a fairly casual uh, wool headband, not unlike the ponytail that I like to wear for traveling, but not really very high style either today or certainly in, uh, in Marie Antoinette's era and certainly not for the court of Versailles. So Marie Antoinette was subjected to kind of a hair makeover with this illustrious French hairdresser and the resulting style, which you can see in the portrait, was, uh, was pretty much then the accepted style for all women of rank at the court of Versailles. It was known as the pompadour after Louis XV, her, the then reigning king and Marie Antoinette's grab 
grandfather, grandfather-in-law after, after his late mistress, Madame de Pompadour, who had been, had been a big trendsetter in the 1750s and 60s. And if I could have my first PowerPoint image, please. There's a lovely image in the, the Louvre show here at the High of Madame de Pompadour, again in the, the same kind of court dress that you just saw on Marie Antoinette, and again with this kind of low, upswept, very elegant hairdo, studded with a few flowers, powdered to make her, look, to make her hair look white or gray, and um, along with the makeup that she's wearing, the rouge, the beauty mark, the perfectly pale skin, which was usually a result of, of pancake makeup, all of those were markings of standing at the court of Versailles. They were instantly recognized as the sign of a noblewoman, of a denizen of the court, of a high rank. So Marie Antoinette learned to powder her hair and wear it in this way. The second thing Marie Antoinette was required to do was to have her teeth fixed. And according to my dentist in New York, who's also a specialist in, um, in dental history, apparently there was no anesthesia available in the 1760s and 70s when Marie Antoinette's apparently quite crooked adolescent teeth were um, submitted to three months of excruciating dental procedures. And the result was that her teeth, uh, after three months, were deemed by the French delegation from Versailles acceptably beautiful and straight for the French court. So in this way, too, Marie Antoinette's body had to be remade in order to reflect the established standards of refinement that were an expression of power, an expression of status at the court of Versailles. Um, the next thing that Marie Antoinette had to do was she had to learn how to move gracefully in an outfit like this, which wasn't necessarily very easy. I mentioned that the train was heavy, the hoop skirts were wide, and the more, uh, the higher up on the court pecking order you were, the wider your hoop skirts, the longer your train, the tighter your corset. In fact, Marie Antoinette and, and Princesses of the Blood were the only women entitled to wear one of the most uncomfortable and fainting-inducing corsets of the entire court. Other women envied this as a, as a great privilege and a mark of prestige, uh, but it was something that was quite difficult to move around in, almost impossible to sit down in or bend over in. And yet, because this too had been uh, imagined, this corset had been imagined by Louis the 14th in his day, and could I get my next PowerPoint image, please? Um, this is Louis the 14th, the Sun King, the, the mastermind behind this cult of appearances at Versailles. Uh, because this kind of uh, physical stiffness and elegance and almost superhuman grace and superhuman qualities had been imagined by Louis the 14th as the perfect outward expression of royal might, royal superiority, royal godliness, Marie Antoinette had to learn to move as if she were something more than human. So she was also uh, subjected to about a year and a half of intensive walking tutorials, being taught how to walk, how to move elegantly in uh, this very restrictive, tight, and uncomfortable court wear. Uh, finally, and certainly not least, Marie Antoinette was told by the, uh, by the visiting diplomats from Versailles that the clothing she wore would never, ever pass muster at uh, the famously discerning court of Versailles. Uh, so Marie Antoinette's mother, the formidable Empress Maria Theresa, the Emper Empress of uh, Austria and of the Habsburg Empire, had uh, a, a small army of French fashion merchants and uh, stylists come across the border to Vienna to restyle the girl. And she spent what um, Maria, Maria Theresa spent the equivalent, the modern equivalent of about two and a half to three million dollars on Marie Antoinette's trousseau to make sure that every stitch of clothing she had was elegant, was French made, and would reflect the greater glory of the family that Marie Antoinette was married into. Now the reason that I'm, I'm insisting on all this in terms of Marie Antoinette's uh, early training before even arriving on French soil is that um, when I was, when I was looking and, and doing research into her clothing, it became very clear to me that with this intensive a tutorial in the importance of appearances, Marie Antoinette recognized pretty quickly that appearances were a tool of enormous political significance at the court of Versailles. And this would be important to her because once she got to Versailles in 1770 to marry Louis, the, the future Louis XVI, and could I have my next PowerPoint, please? Uh, this is Louis XVI a few years later, uh, a fairly idealized bust from the, from the Louvre show, but apparently he was um, quite grossly overweight, very timid, very 
awkward, very shy. Both his father and two of his older brothers had died unexpectedly, leaving him in the position of having to become king when he really didn't want to or feel prepared for this kind of role. Uh, when Marie Antoinette arrived in 1770 to marry him, she was expected to do something else that was important besides looking the part of the, of the great Bourbon princess, which by all accounts she did very well when she arrived there. She was also expected to endear herself to her husband. She was 14, he was 15, and to endear herself to him, especially sexually, so that she could start bearing uh, plenty of Bourbon princes to shore up the succession. As I just mentioned, uh, Louis XVI himself only became heir to the throne because three other people died unexpectedly before him. This wasn't uncommon in early modern France. The reigning king at the time when Marie Antoinette arrived in France was Louis XV, grandfather of Louis XVI. So Marie Antoinette's job was to make sure that the Bourbon line didn't die out. But this was a problem for Marie Antoinette. And, um, oh, but it had been, and can I get my slide again now, please? This, this job had been, exempt, had been performed in an exemplary way by Marie Antoinette's predecessor, Maria Leczynska, the Polish-born Polish queen who died in 1768. Maria Leczynska had pretty much uh, done her job of dressing according to court standards and um, Get, appealing to her husband enough that she could bear him many children. And then she basically left her husband alone to be the sort of glorious center of splendor and attention at the court and to spend his time with much more glamorous, trend-setting uh, mistresses like Madame de Pompadour. Uh, once she had borne her children, her job was pretty much done and she could get out of the way, be a good retiring wife, and devote herself to good works and religion. Uh, this is a, a portrait of Maria Lachinska from 1748, uh, reading one of the uh, the religious religious books that, that she loved to read. And this was pretty much the model that was invoked to Marie Antoinette daily when she arrived at the age of 14 at Versailles, be like Maria Lachinska, have plenty of children. This was a problem because Marie Antoinette, for the life of her, couldn't get her husband to consummate their marriage. Uh, some of you who've seen, has anyone here seen the Sofia Coppola film of Marie Antoinette? So, yeah, so beautiful A, B, uh, one of the main things that, that Coppola focuses on in that film is in fact the, the, the frustrating, um, puzzling for Marie Antoinette lack of a sex life between her and her husband. She had been very much told by the time she left Vienna that this was her job. In fact, she wasn't even allowed to leave Vienna until she had had her first menstrual period to make sure that she was fertile by the time she arrived at Versailles. This was this basic an element of her job. But for a combination of psychological reasons, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, and possible physiological problems, her 15-year-old her bridegroom was absolutely unwilling to do the deed. And this left Marie Antoinette in a very dangerous position at the court. Um, when I talked about Louis XVI psychological problems, what I meant more specifically was that there was still very much at the court of Versailles in the 1770s an incredibly strong bias against the royal house of Austria. Austria, as I mentioned before, had been France's enemy, its hereditary enemy for centuries. And although Marie Antoinette had been brought on board as part of a new dipl diplomatic initiative to make friends with the Austrians, that was an initiative that was basically supported only by the king, Louis XV, and by one of his most powerful ministers, the Duc de Choiseul. Everybody else at Versailles hated the idea. Everybody else at Versailles, more or less, and there were at least 2,000 courtiers who lived at Versailles at, on any given, uh, at any given month. Um, they, hated, they still hated the Austrians. They hated the idea of a diplomatic rapprochement with this great enemy. They hated the idea of an Austrian woman one day sitting on the throne of France. Uh, Louis XVI himself, uh, or future Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette's husband, had in fact been raised by two of the most uh, foaming at the mouth anti-Austrian courtiers at the entire palace who had tutored him uh, growing up in isolation from pretty much everyone else at the court because he was considered too grand and godly to mingle even with the other aristocrats and royals. They had raised him to believe that even his father's and mother's deaths, both of which had been caused by tuberculosis, were actually the result of poisoning by Austrian spies. Uh, so by the time Marie Antoinette arrived, having been told she needed to be charming, she needed to appeal to her husband, and she got regular letters from her mother reminding her of this fact and reminding her of this job, uh, Marie Antoinette couldn't convince Louis XVI to become intimate with her. 
Meanwhile, she was surrounded by thousands of courtiers who were essentially plotting her demise and who were aware of the fact that if this future queen couldn't bear heirs for the kingdom, she could possibly be shipped back to Vienna in disgrace and replaced with a different candidate. This is where Marie Antoinette's early fashion training paradoxically comes in handy. It seems to me, and, and uh, my book just came out in England, and, and one of the reviewers there, obviously Princess Diana is still a big royal uh, model and a big figure over there in, in, in the public imagination, and one of the reviewers of my book said, well, yes, Marie Antoinette hit upon the Queen of Hearts approach in France, and that's essentially, in re referring to Diana, and that's essentially what she did through fashion. Marie Antoinette was aware of the fact and was made aware by constant missives from the Viennese court that she was under huge pressure to establish herself as an authority figure at Versailles, to establish herself as somebody who had a certain amount of power and prestige. Conventionally, this was only done by looking grand in the conventional way that had more or less been the same since Louis XIV 100 years before, and by bearing children. Marie Antoinette was fine with the looking grand part, but she couldn't give the, the kingdom an heir. For that reason, she took a page from Louis XIV's own book, the, uh, the Sun King himself, who had turned to experiments in clothing as a way of, of signaling royal power and uh, prestige. And she started experimenting fashion with her, with, in her own way, and essentially in that way appealed, like Princess Diana some hundred years later, to a much larger public. She made herself a celebrity, and she made herself a fashion icon far outside the bounds of the gilded realm of Versailles itself, where everyone was almost quite openly, openly, openly plotting against her. Now, as it so happens, uh, Marie Antoinette found this task facilitated by contemporary developments in the French fashion world in Paris in the 1770s. Uh, the 1770s were an exciting time for French fashion, largely because, before Marie Antoinette even came on the scene, largely because the bourgeoisie in France was growing ever richer due to kind of early developments in, in trade and early capitalism as the aristocracy's economic power was declining. And even though the bourgeoisie were still under the old regime, denied a considerable amount of the, the political and legal privileges that were enjoyed by the aristocracy, the bourgeoisie were making more and more money and wanting to show it off, entering into competition with their so-called betters in the aristocracy and using fashion as a way of doing this. And this had really become possible for them to do in the 1770s, uh, mostly due to the emergence of a, a fairly new group of women f fashion um, purveyors known as marchandes de mode, or fashion merchants. And under the guild system of early modern France, these women weren't allowed to make dresses, but what they were allowed to do was take an old dress and trim it with any number of inventive new trimmings that would make it look new. This was, and they were also allowed to create headdresses and bonnets that you could slap on with the same old blue velvet dress or black silk dress and make the whole outfit suddenly look distinctive, creative, trendy, modern, and new. And this became a way for the bourgeoisie, uh, not unlike um, I lived in New York City in the, in the, in, for part of the 1980s, and that was also a time, of course, when there was a lot of new money to be had and people wanting to show that money on their person with the logo bags and the Chanel suits. And uh, essentially, this is what the bourgeoisie was doing with headdresses like this, believe it or not, in the 1770s. They were uh, capturing public attention. They were outdoing one another in spending and in ostentation. Uh, in part with uh, a headdress that became Marie Antoinette's signature look, this poof, uh, which I've shown here. Uh, the poof was a three foot high, usually, headdress built on a scaffolding of wire, horsehair, cotton, cotton wool, um, fake hair, and then the wear wearer's own hair kind of teased up around it and powdered with thick hair powder into place. And that was the underlying architecture. But then the poof could be, uh, could be ornamented, that kind of basic underlying structure could be ornamented with a number of whimsical items that, again, could be changed on a daily basis in order for the wearer to look fashionable, elegant, unusual, and new. Uh, so what we have here is a really funny image from the 1770s. And this seems to have been a, a caricature of Marie Antoinette herself and the, the pair of stylists who, when she acceded to the throne with her husband, at age 18 in 1774 became known as her Ministry of Fashion. 
Um, the woman on the left is uh, Rose Bertin, her favorite female fashion merchant, the one who did her dress trimmings and did her headdresses and did her poofs. The man on the right was a celebrity hairdresser named Monsieur Léonard, who until that moment had only waited upon uh, kind of a demi-monde of famous actresses and dancers who got their money by being the kept women of rich bourgeois and aristocrats in Paris. All of a sudden, this man is using his creative powers to help the queen look alluring, distinctive, unusual, and new. Um, and what we have here is, is, is a really funny image because here, Monsieur Léonard is actually removing the ostrich feathers that were one of Marie Antoinette's favorite adornments for her poof and apparently she seems to have liked them because they added another few feet on top of the three foot high uh, underlying scaffolding to always make her the, the highest haired woman at any particular gathering. This was straight out of Louis XIV looking grander, looking larger than life, looking richer and more prestigious than anybody else in the room. Marie Antoinette was still childless at this time but the poof was becoming the way that she captured public attention not just at Versailles but in Paris, where she started traveling several times a week, going to public functions, becoming somebody who is breathlessly, avidly observed by the entire Parisian public, something that more retiring French queens before her had never done. So the ostrich feathers were one way of heightening, literally and figuratively, her, her visibility in the public eye, but they weren't the only way at all. What we have Rose Bertin waiting on the side with is um, the elements for what was known as a pouf à la jardinière, a gardener's pouf. And this was a real poof that Marie Antoinette supposedly wore, um, where Marie Antoinette, and she loved this poof, uh, she would have a radishes, carrots, tomatoes, onions, and a large head of uh, cabbage or lettuce installed in the middle for a more natural look than the, than the jewels and the flowers that had been associated with Madame de Pompadour's relatively low-key, low-scale, low-slung hairstyle. This is a huge change in fashion, and it was really Marie Antoinette who made it so. Um, now, the poofs, actually, the pouf à la jardinière falls into the first of two categories that existed for the pouf, that again, both of which became really helpful for Marie Antoinette in carving out a public image for herself that made her seem a force to be reckoned with, even at a time when she was still failing by the traditional standards of royal motherhood. Uh, and that first category of pouf was called a pouf au sentiment, a sentimental pouf. And that was basically where the wearer could express any individual feeling that he or she, or she, he or she, there are a few men who wore poofs, and I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but largely, any, the wearer, the, the, any feeling that she had, any particular personal message she wanted to convey, any personal triumph she wanted to, uh, to express or pay homage to, uh, Marie Antoinette, it seems, first became enamored of the poof when it was a very new and unusual look invented by these two stylists, uh, when one of Marie Antoinette's cousins-in-law, who also had been struggling with uh, bearing royal heirs for, for her part of the Bourbon family, finally gave birth to a son and celebrated this birth by, and basically trying to show off to the entire court, I know you all were making fun of me for being barren, now I've done it, look at me, look at my poof, childbirth poof installed in her hair um, with a childbirth scene which unfortunately we don't have any, any visual images of but the, the newspapers in Paris commented on it extensively and quite excitedly and the, the less gruesome version of the childbirth poof that I've read about in, in some of these newspapers was this, this princess Marie Antoinette's cousin-in-law resting in bed after a long labor with a wet nurse sitting in an elegant throne-like chair nursing the newborn baby at her breast while a, an African page with a turban and a jewel-studded bright green parrot looked on in wonder, delight, and joy. So, um, it, and you can see, I mean, this is ridiculous, of course, and it's absurd, but it, it became a really convenient way for Marie Antoinette to start expressing herself and sending little messages that were either coded or not so coded to her own enemies at court. Uh, one, Marie Antoinette's greatest nemesis at court, uh, and really up until the moment when she and her husband acceded to the throne, was the other most powerful technically woman at court, which was Madame du Barry, uh, King Louis XV's last mistress. 
Uh, very well played, I thought, in the Sofia Coppola movie by Asia Argento. It's just a kind of tacky, debauched woman who loved to spend a lot of money on very revealing uh, kind of clothes and questionable taste. And um, Marie Antoinette and Dubarry hated each other. Dubarry was at the center of an anti-Austrian faction that wanted to get Marie Antoinette shipped back to Austria. She didn't like the idea of having another pretty woman around, possibly to influence the throne. And um, Marie Antoinette uh, found herself up against a lot of powerful supporters of this woman. And one of the ways in which Marie Antoinette finally tried to express some independence early on was to become a, a, something of a, um, a patron of the arts in Paris. And Marie Antoinette loved music. And she had been trained by the, uh, the famous composer Gluck when she was back in Vienna. And so she invited him to come and stage an opera in Paris. Madame Dubarry got wind of this decided to organize a big group of people to go and boo at the opera so that Marie Antoinette would be publicly shamed for having brought such a terrible piece of Austrian, god-awful, savage music to the cultivated French. Marie Antoinette organized a sort of counterfaction of people to go and clap louder than the people who were booing. She triumphed. It was declared the success of the opera season. And Marie Antoinette, to celebrate and to gloat and rub in her victory to, to Madame Dubarry, showed up at court in a, an opera poof with all the figures from the opera on it. Um, so again, it, it seems crazy and it seems ridiculous now, but it really did become a very creative tool for Marie Antoinette to start asserting herself. Uh, the second kind of poof that she could also use when she wanted to and other ladies followed suit was called the poof à la circonstance, the, the current events poof. And with this, uh, women could show that they were up on current events, that they could declare their, their preference. If, for instance, most of them would declare their preference for the French when the French went to war with the English in our own war of independence. Uh, this is a poof called the poof à la belle poule, known to my editor as the shiphead. He calls this the shiphead. Um, the shiphead was very popular in the 1770s. It was probably the most popular poof that Marie Antoinette launched. It's charming, obviously. And Marie Antoinette wore this to celebrate, I believe in 1777, to celebrate a, uh, a key battle of a French warship, the belle poule, over a British man of war. Uh, somewhere in the Atlantic. Uh, so this was another way that women could kind of show, and Marie Antoinette, this is another variation on the shiphead, uh, that women could, uh, could, could really sit, distinguish themselves and, and carve out very personalized identities for themselves through fashion. And this was something that Marie Antoinette did wonderfully well. And in the early days of her reign, from 1774 until about 1776 or 1777, the strategy, the Queen of Hearts strategy, seemed to be working for Marie Antoinette. Uh, by most accounts, whenever she showed up at a public function in Paris or wandered through the Bois de Boulogne or the Champs Elysees or any of the public promenades where royal people were never, had never really been seen before except maybe riding through in a carriage on their way to a state function, Marie Antoinette mingled with the people. She wanted to be seen looking like this. She wanted a larger public to fall in love with her, and initially they really did. Uh, the, her, her hairdresser, Monsieur Léonard, has really hilarious passages in his memoirs talking about people trampling one another and stampeding one another to get a glimpse of her latest poof. And uh, usually these are sort of self-aggrandizing passages in his memoirs where he talks about one appearance that she made at a, at a theater in Paris where he said something like, the Fuhrer was so great to see Marie Antoinette that ten ribs were broken, one ankle was sprained, you know, one person died in the stampede, which is of course not true, my triumph was complete. Uh, but Marie Antoinette's triumph was complete too because she had reinvented the role of the French queen as a fashion icon, as a fashion celebrity, and as a public celebrity that people cared about well outside of the court. All of a sudden, nobody was really talking as much about the fact that she was barren. All of a sudden, her enemies were having a harder time at first making the case that she, could get, she should get back, sent back to Austria. Uh, but unfortunately for Marie Antoinette, the tide pretty soon turned against her. Um, first and foremost, because the people who didn't like her already at Versailles really had a problem with the fact that Marie Antoinette had single-handedly changed the look of the French court. Uh, I know that this to us still looks just kind of like 18th century frou-frou dress, not unlike what we saw in the portraits of Madame de Pompadour and the coronation portrait of Marie Antoinette I showed you before. But in fact, the look is tremendously different. The hoop skirts are still in place. Marie Antoinette did hate those, and I'll, I'll get to that later. But they're, they're trimmed with a lot more furbelows and bows and kind of excessive fanciful trimming 
things, again, that Rose Bertin could vary all the time. Uh, and we also see that this is a portrait of Marie Antoinette from 1776 and two of her ladies-in-waiting at Versailles. Uh, all of these women are now also wearing the pouf, the three-foot-high headdress. It's a very different look, in fact, from what Madame de Pompadour had worn, from what women had been wearing for over 100 years at court. And um, in fact, Marie Antoinette was, became quite disdainful of the standard conventional court costume, especially as adopted by the and as clung to by the more conservative members of the court who didn't like to see change being made to Louis XIV's well-established system of, uh, of court dress. Marie Antoinette referred to these people as centuries because their clothing looked about 100 years old. It looked dowdy. It would be like me coming in and dressing like Queen Victoria to talk to you. The look was that different uh, from Marie Antoinette's perspective. And uh, this was something that a lot of her palace enemies really didn't take too kindly to. They didn't appreciate the fact that especially this foreign queen, this, uh, this Austrian-born woman who nobody wanted there to begin with, was trampling on all of the, the rules and conventions that had been established by the great Sun King. Um, but Marie Antoinette's public relations problem became even greater when, I know I love this one, uh, became even greater when these aristocrats started, and many of them actually had not only residences in Paris outside of Versailles, but also uh, private printing presses, and they started publishing pamphlets uh, basically circulating very scurrilous rumors about Marie Antoinette and how unfit she was for her role of queen. And Marie Antoinette's enemies focused quite quickly on the poof as proof not that she was to be loved like a queen of hearts, but proof that she was spending too much money on, on frivolity, on ridiculousness, uh, in a way that the public should really be upset about. And indeed, a larger public, a common-born public outside the court did start to become upset, first when they started hearing rumors that Marie Antoinette's poofs had grown so high that she was demanding that her husband rebuild parts of Versailles to accommodate her headdresses with higher doorways. And this is a satirical print from the 1770s that seems to reflect that rumor, although we do know, in fact, that Marie Antoinette's poofs and the one adopted by her many, many imitators, um, also uh, did pose real problems getting through doorways. There are really funny uh, images from this period and, and uh, memoirs relating how women would have to ride to the opera with their heads sticking out of carriages, windows, or they would have to kneel on the floor. Um, apparently in the 1770s, three women did die from having their poofs catch fire to, uh, to chandeliers candlelit chandeliers in, in crowded public ballroom uh, spaces and, and public parties. So uh, Marie Antoinette started to get in trouble really as somebody who had led fashion in this direction. It was costing not only all of her imitators a lot of money to keep up with her because Marie Antoinette with her hand on the, on the royal purse strings really could, could vary her look as often as she wanted, but also it was seen that once again she was doing something to really alter the, the very fabric of French royal tradition. How dare she come and try to change the architecture of Versailles? It was a rumor, it wasn't true, but it was something that the public pretty soon started to hold against Marie Antoinette. Um, just as bad for, for Marie Antoinette's public image at this time with the poof was the, uh, was the unfortunate fact that shortly after her and her husband's accession, uh, France had a series of, of singularly bad harvests. France was still largely an agrarian economy at the time. It depended, everybody's, um, everybody's well-being depended quite heavily on the success of grain harvests every year. And what a few bad uh, grain harvests meant was tremendous sh uh, shortages in flour and bread. Uh, in the mid-1770s, there thus erupted a series of, of large-scale riots called the Flower Wars, where uh, in one of them, 5,000 people stormed the gates of Versailles, insisting that Marie Antoinette was hoarding all of the flour for herself. Uh, this was an interesting charge because, of course, uh, Marie Antoinette and all of her fellow denizens of Versailles were still eating quite well at the court, uh, despite the flour shortage. But the idea that this charge would be laid at Marie Antoinette's feet in particular, I think may have had something to do with the fact that her three-foot-high poofs required huge amounts of hair powder, as I mentioned, and flour was one of the main ingredients in hair powder. So uh, some of you may know, those of you who read the Antonia Fraser book, that uh, the phrase, let them eat cake, was a phrase that had been circulated to discredit French queens for over a century before Marie Antoinette was even born. But I think that the, the, the phrase really stuck to her legend as a function of the fact that she was using an ingredient in cake 
cake or in brioche, in her hair so visibly in these wedding cake headdresses at a time when more and more of the public were going hungry. Uh, this was also a problem for Marie Antoinette because of the fact that uh, precisely because she was such an interesting figure to the French media, she really spawned the birth of the modern French fashion magazine as we know it today. That it had a, it had a, a short, brief, tiny little um, a flowering in the late 17th century under Louis XIV when a newspaper, the Mercure Galant, started writing comments on women's fashions. But the idea of an illustrated fashion magazine that came out regularly, periodically, and uninterruptedly for long periods of time documenting what fashionable women were wearing was something that this public interest in Marie Antoinette really generated. It's something, of course, that remains with us to this day. But the problem for Marie Antoinette was once the flower wars happened, all of a sudden a larger and larger public, even outside of Paris, could, through these fashion journals, become aware of the Queen's quite excessive fashion statements. Uh, and that's at, at the, it was at exactly that time that, th in a much larger way, sat satirical prints like this started circulating, showing a royal women, woman not identified as Marie Antoinette, um, with a poof that it, obviously it looks like a swan, and so the comical aspect of this is these men are firing at this big poof instead of at the real birds that are nearby. Uh, but the hostility in this in this plate is unmistakable, that there's also the idea that this poof is something that would be good enough for these relatively hungry commoners to eat. And um, that, was some, that was something that would haunt Marie Antoinette until her death, until it, when, even at her trial in October of 1793, just before she was guillotined, she was accused again of having hoarded the resources of the French and having used them in ways that, that would have been better uh, served uh, actually feeding her subjects. So the poof, which had started out as a real public relations gambit and something that advanced Marie Antoinette's public image in good ways, became something that generated a backlash about her within the space of a few years. Marie Antoinette seems to have recognized this. And um, as the 1770s wore on, she started spending more and more time at her famous country retreat, the Petit Trianon, um, from which we have some, there are some beautiful uh, Sèvres China pieces in this exhibit from the Louvre. Uh, Marie Antoinette com commissioned a lot of those pieces for the Petit Trianon. Um, this was her country retreat where Marie Antoinette again experimented with a very different kind of queenly image. Abandoning her powdered poofs, Marie Antoinette decided to take her uh, her attempt at carving out a new identity in a very different direction. She rejected the the centuries, the, the, the stiff, corseted, uncomfortable, ceremonial wear of the court. And at her little country palace, she mandated that women should dress casually and comfortably. In an amazing, unheard of reversal of the standard royal decree by order of the king, Marie Antoinette at, at the Petit Trianon, her little country retreat, signed a number of decrees, all of the decrees, in fact, connecting to costuming and gardening and everything at this, at this little palace were signed by order of the queen. Uh, the public realized that, in fact, Marie Antoinette was setting up a little counter kingdom where she was the, the sole and reigning person in charge. This was scandalous to the French public. It was radical. The king was always the one in charge. But here, this childless Austrian woman had dared to rewrite the rules of her own royal behavior and had really set up her own little palace right on the grounds of Versailles. What's so interesting to me about this, uh, this larger rebellion is the fact that it manifested itself so directly and so strikingly in clothes. And here again, we really see with Marie Antoinette the beginnings of modern fashion, not only in the fashion magazines and the kind of cycles of obsolescence and uh, women and ostentation that we saw with the poof, but here in a move towards simplicity and comfort that really hadn't been part of the female fashion consciousness before. In uh, this portrait from 1778 by Antoine Vestier showing Marie Antoinette in the gardens of the Petit Trianon, she's wearing an outfit that by order of the queen became the more or less official uniform of the Petit Trianon. Starting from head to toe, we see first that Marie Antoinette has abandoned altogether the controversial hair powder of her poofs, but it's also the hair powder that would have made her visible and recognizable as an aristocrat. She got rid of it. So here again, we see her curly red hair, which had so offended the French diplomats when they first visited Vienna uh, years before. She's abandoned makeup as well. All of the thick makeup that was generally associated with and required of women of her standing, she got rid of. Um, and then most interestingly, for me at least, uh, the, the clothing that she started 
started wearing there was very, very different. Um, first of all, under the white dress that she's wearing was known as a chemise dress, a kind of simple, roughly dress that was relatively unstructured. If it was worn over a corset at all, it was a very soft bodice of cloth, so not particularly restrictive. The way in which it was given structure was either by an overcoat or jacket like this one, or by a simple sash at the waist. So it was a very loose, comfortable kind of dress, uh, almost as radical in its time as blue jeans have been in ours in terms of the relative mobility and ease and comfort that it, uh, it accorded to the women who wore it. Um, Marie Antoinette also loved, she was a, an accomplished equestrian, and she also loved the kind of androgyny and simplicity of, of the riding habit, which was based, of course, on, on male, men's British suits especially. Uh, and so what she's wearing here over her chemise dress is uh, something that was known as a redingote or a riding coat, a very simple, unornamented coat, which again, no trimmings, no lace, no jewels, no, no ruffles, no nothing. The ruffles are from the chemise, but the coat itself is quite plain in a very simple and elegant color. And this Marie Antoinette really uh, reinvented as a new kind of elegance, this dressing down, which again was more or less unknown and unheard of before she made this look a popular look at the Petit Trianon. What again was, uh, fashion might have had to move in this direction anyway. It's hard for, I think, any of us to imagine walking around in whalebone corsets and 12-foot uh, wide, hoop, wide hoop skirts on a daily basis today. But what was so shocking about Marie Antoinette's role in all of this is again she was a queen doing away with these more formal accoutrements of, of elegant dress and she was a queen rewriting elegant dress as something relatively democratic and modern uh, this was a look that was uh, fairly easy to copy because the muslin dress, because the redingote weren't particularly ornamented or complex to construct they were easily copied by women of all classes as in fact was the straw hat which Marie Antoinette off to the left left there, my, left, my right, your left, uh, favored as, as her only adornment uh, for this kind of outfit. Um, this is a portrait by Vigée Lebrun, also from the late 1770s, of Marie Antoinette's nemesis, Madame du Barry. Even Madame du Barry started wearing the white dress and the straw hat. And you know that if Madame du Barry was wearing it, everyone was wearing it because she so seldom wanted to give in to trends that Marie Antoinette had started. And indeed, uh, many contemporary commentators observed at this time that because of the Queen's adoption of the white chemise dress, the streets of France were flooded with little white dresses and straw hats. The look of, of French fashion had radically changed, again as a function of Marie Antoinette experimenting quite radically with what it meant to be and to look like a queen. Now, this was a real problem for, again, many conservative partisans of the status quo in France. Uh, the whole point behind Louis XIV's entrenched system of etiquette and of sartorial codes was that a princess could easily be distinguished from a countess, could easily be distinguished from a banker's wife, could easily be distinguished from a farmer's wife, could easily be distinguished from a prostitute. Uh, the, the sartorial codes of 17th and early 18th century France were still quite fixed and in place so that if you walked through court or if you walked through Paris, you knew what the social class was of the person that you were seeing because of their dress. By making everyone fall in love with the little white dress and the straw hat, Marie Antoinette was seen to be um, very dangerously mixing class boundaries and uh, visible signs of class uh, allegiance and adherence with her fashions. And this was something that a lot of people weren't very happy about from all ends of the class spectrum. Ironically enough, uh, commoners, many of whom one might expect would appreciate this kind of egalitarian standing in fashion with their queen, really disliked the fact that the queen seemed to be lowering herself to their level. Certainly aristocrats, although female aristocrats wanting to keep up with this great trendsetter, uh, kept copying Marie Antoinette. Uh, many aristocrats complained that their, their stature was, was um, had been diminished because of the kind of vogue that their queen had put in place. And the public outcry over this vogue really reached its apogee in 1783 when Marie Antoinette posed for this portrait by her favorite portraitist, uh, Vigée Lebrun. Uh, this is called the portrait of the queen in a chemise. And here again, you can see the, the uniform of the Petit Trianon the unpowdered curly hair, the straw hat adorned simply with a few feathers, the white muslin roughly dressed, really structured only by a sash at the waist and a few ribbons tied around the sleeves. 
Uh, and what's so shocking or what was so shocking to 18th century eyes about this portrait is this is a portrait of a queen where there's nothing queenly about it at all. There's not one iconographic or sartorial marking in this portrait that would identify her as a member of the House of Bourbon. There's no crown sitting on a pillow. There are no magnificent jewels. There are no Bourbon lily flowers, the fleur de lys, which was, the, of course, the iconic flower of the House of Bourbon. Uh, no, nothing to show that this woman was a queen. And what was so shocking for uh, the public was that Marie Antoinette had dared to pose as herself and to identify herself as a queen but with trappings that she alone had chosen uh, as, as part of her look. The, 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 the portrait was so considered so scandalous, it was actually shown at the Louvre to a, to a very large public, open to people from all walks of life in 1783. And the scandal at the Louvre was so huge that after just a few days, the portrait had to be removed from the gallery altogether. Uh, before it was removed, people were, uh, were writing in the press and in, in memoirs and correspondence that the queen had dressed herself up like a serving girl, that the queen had dared to pose in her underwear, that the queen had tricked herself out like a whore. And uh, my favorite, uh, one aristocrat commented that the queen wasn't dressed so much like a queen as like a little country wench who should be serving lemonade at a stand in some village in provincial France. So this is how that portrait looked to 18th century eyes. To try to um, to stem a little bit of the tide of, of negative opinion that, that really started to swell against Marie Antoinette at this point, Vigée Lebrun hastily executed this portrait, which of course looks quite similar in terms of the pose. She's holding the rose, which was her favorite flower, and you can see the rose on many of the Sèvres porcelain pieces in this exhibit. But otherwise, Marie Antoinette has been dressed in the kind of clothing she was supposed to have been wearing all along. Here she's wearing the elegant paneered silk court dress trimmed with lace. Both silk and lace, not incidentally, were cherished uh, products of the French luxury industry. The problem with muslin that uh, Marie Antoinette so loved was that it was imported from Habsburg-controlled territories and from England. So in fact, uh, silk workers by the thousands complained that the queen was actually, by initiating this trend in favor of muslin, was ruining their livelihood and was damaging something that was quintessentially French in favor of something that was foreign. Here we see Marie Antoinette again in what was quintessentially French, but it seemed that the public wasn't really convinced. Uh, this was an era, the, the late 1700s, 1980s was in an era when even though Marie Antoinette started posing for more conventional portraits, here again we see her in a nice rich silk, uh, French silk velvet and ermine trimmed eminently royal dress. We see all of the trappings of royalty in this portrait. Her feet are on uh, that little footstool which was always a sign of, of royalty. She's, she's too noble to even have her feet touching the ground. Um, she started posing for portraits like this, ex exhibiting them at the Louvre as well for the public, uh, but the, the damage had been done and this woman was seen as having simply taken too many liberties with a, a tightly circumscribed role that had served fairly well for generations before her. It didn't even help that by the late 1780s, Marie Antoinette had finally managed to talk her husband into bed and had had a small brood of royal children. She actually had four children by 1788 when this portrait was painted, but one of the, the babies, her youngest daughter, died, and so it was that baby was painted out. But here Marie Antoinette is really doing a, an attempt at, a, at, at public relations damage control to show that she's just your average, typical, good French queen, dressed in the typical French way, again in sumptuous ermine trimmed silk, again with very elegant jewelry, and with her royal brood, the so-called children of France, posing around her, she seemed to be backtracking from the more radical kinds of celebrity and kinds of identity she had tried to establish for herself in order finally to placate a very unhappy public. Uh, but, but that placating didn't ever really take effect. As you all surely know, in 1789, when the Bastille fell, one of the first things that happened was the public marched on Versailles a few months later, um, crying especially for Marie Antoinette's head. The public had by now, the revolutionary public, had adopted a, a symbol of the revolution of liberty, equality, and fraternity that was expressed in a red, white, and blue ribbon worn as a rosette or kind of a big, bushy, um, 
bushy round bow, or it was compared often to a, large, uh, a small cabbage um, on, their, on their coats and in their hats. And this was made of red, white, and blue ribbon. And when the public marched on Versailles in October 1789, crying from Marie Antoinette's head, one of the battle cries was they wanted to eviscerate the queen and turn her entrails into red ribbons for their, for their tricolor rosettes. So her, the association of the, the queen who was so hated and clothing and a revolution in costume was clear even in this attack on Versailles. Uh, they wanted to reverse everything that they thought she had stood for in the way of dangerous excess and toying with French traditions that she had had no business touching at all, never mind the fact that the revolutionaries were toying with the greatest tradition of all, which was the French monarchy. Uh, but Marie Antoinette really remained the most hated figure throughout the revolution. Um, even though she started uh, herself wearing tricolor ribbons to try again to appease the public once they were placed under house arrest in October of 1789. Uh, images like this circulated, suggesting that the queen had never really changed her spots, that she was somebody who was a shapeshifter, she was good at putting on different identities, but she was somebody who underneath it all couldn't be trusted at all. And in fact, the, uh, a, a good friend of mine who, who specializes in Italian literature told me that the choice of the leopard is interesting not only for the spot changing reference but also because in, um, in Dante and Boccaccio and other works that were very familiar to any educated even bourgeois uh, a, a French man in, uh, in the 1780s and 90s uh, the leopard stood for lust in Dante and in Boccaccio and in fact Marie Antoinette was also again seen to have been whorish in her tastes especially in this loose unstructured chemise and there's some uh, really alarming and kind of unintentionally funny uh, uh, pornographic prints of Marie Antoinette during this period where her chemise is shown as having her breasts spilling out of it or having lovers sticking their hands up under the loose and unstructured skirts, really showing how there is a moral rot at the heart of the kingdom that the queen's very fashion choices uh, as avant-garde and as liberal as they were um, was actually facilitating that the queen had turned the kingdom into this place of debauchery and excessive license. So Marie Antoinette was never to be forgiven for her revolution in fashion. Um, on August uh, 10, 1792, she and her husband and family were removed from the Tuileries where they had been under house arrest and they were arrested for real and placed in prison. And this is a really amazing scene where what happened was um, the revolutionary soldiers came and symbolically to show that the revolution had displaced the crown, they clamped their other favorite symbol, the red uh, drooping bonnet of liberty, on the king's head. And here he's shown in his pajamas, which is an exaggeration. He was fully dressed when this happened to him. But he's made more ridiculous by this image. of um, They clamped the, uh, the bonnet on his head. And here we see Marie Antoinette off to the side, looking angry, scolding the revolutionaries for attempting to do this. And in fact, uh, so soon after this moment, they clamped one on her head, and she trampled it to the ground. Uh, much more than her husband, she was opposed to the idea of the revolution and all that it stood for, and the revolutionaries didn't appreciate her for it. Um, so eventually, of course, Marie Antoinette uh, herself was sent to the guillotine 10 months after her husband. She was guillotined in October of 1793. But she did have one last defiant fashion statement up her sleeve. Marie Antoinette had been reduced to wearing rags in prison. Um, and the night before, or when she was condemned to death as, a, as an enemy of the state, on the night of uh, October 15, 1793, she went back to her squalid little six-by-six-foot prison cell, and according to the woman who had been hired to both wait on her and keep an eye on her in, in jail, she amazingly pulled out of a, a small, almost imperceptible hole in the wall a, a, a pristine white chemise that she had been keeping in reserve, apparently just for her last public appearance. Uh, this was one of the most moving things that, that I read in, in, in leafing through all of the, and in burrowing through all of the different fashion statements Marie Antoinette made through her life uh, for a few reasons. First of all, because it showed that yet again she was trying to take control of her public image at a time when so much of the deck was stacked against her. Secondly, it was a brave move because white was actually had been deemed uh, an illegal or suspect color during the, the reign of terror, which was starting right around then, unless it was included or accompanied with red and, and blue as symbols of the revolution. Uh, white was the color of the bourbon lily flower. White was the color of the fallen monarchy. And so Marie Antoinette essentially 
actually went to her death, paraded through the streets of Paris where hundreds of thousands of people turned out to see her die, uh, dressed in the color of the monarchy that in the end she refused to give up. But the paradox, of course, was that this modern, distinctly anti-royal dress had also been what had fueled her demise. And in the end, the chemise was a symbol of the, the power of fashion to do both too much for Marie Antoinette and too little. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weber will now take some questions from the audience, if anyone has any questions. Yes. Oh, yes, please, over there. Hi. I know that they found, um, I think, one of her shoes at the end. Did any of her clothing survive anywhere still to That's a great question. And, um, yes, they did find one of her. There are two of her shoes that survive, uh, one that fell off her, her foot on her way to the guillotine and uh, one that fell off her foot at that moment when I was showing you when they were clamping the bonnets on their head on August 10th. Uh, and they're tiny, by the way. I measured them with my hand, and um, they're the size of my pinky. Even though she was considered quite tall, she had very tiny feet. Um, but no, sadly, because of the fact that the revolutionaries hated her so much and her clothing so much in particular, it seems that her tremendous clothing collection was slated for particular revolutionary destructiveness and ire. They destroyed almost everything. They auctioned off what was left to, uh, to serve and finance the revolutionary state. Um, and so one of the real challenges for me of writing this book was trying to reconstruct her wardrobe without any surviving dresses at all. And uh, the good news is that because she turned herself into such a fashion icon where people commented constantly on what she was wearing, uh, there are amazing there's amazing documentation about what she wore. One of the best archives I consulted is an archive with all of her fashion orders, all of the things that she ordered uh, throughout over a period of, of over a decade. And so you could really see what colors she chose, what styles she chose, but sadly the dresses themselves don't survive. More decorative pieces have survived. Um, very little jewelry that I know of has survived again because one of the things, one of the obvious places for the new revolutionary government to look to, to finance itself was to all of the treasures in the, in the Garde Meuble. And that's again one of the really amazing and wonderful things about this show at the Louvre is these are pieces that, um, that did manage to survive. But there was a huge public auction, and I'm, I'm not remembering the date I give it in my book, but I think it was August 1793. Um, where, where the government essentially sold off all of the riches of the crown. They melted down Marie Antoinette's and her husband's crowns and scepters for, for gold ingots. Uh, so, so, so much was really destroyed. And what did survive, um, the best was little bits and pieces, you know, like the shoes, little swatches of fabric of Marie Antoinette's clothes still exist here and there that were, were essentially taken by people who favored the monarchy and wanted to remember them as, to keep these things as royalist relics. So they are also in private collections. I, I feel like since I started working on this book, the, the secret royalists have come out of the woodwork, like, well, my great-grandmother has a birdcage that you might want to see that we didn't want to tell anybody was from her, but because we were aristocrats and we had to flee. Uh, so there are pieces in private collections but they're, um, the best place to look, and you probably know this because you referenced the shoe, is the Musée Carnavalet in Paris has one of the shoes, the one she lost when she was sent to jail on August 10, 1792, has some swatches of fabric, has a fan that she carried her first day in, uh, on French soil, which I write about a little bit in my book. So I had to make a lot. I wouldn't say I made a silk purse out of a sow's ear, but I had to make a, I know, because, because it's not a sow's ear. The material that's left is amazing, but it's, it's very hard to find. It wasn't like just walking into a big gallery of costumes and, and saying, oh, well, what am I going to write about today? There was a real bit of detective work that, uh, that had to go into finding, finding what she might have worn and how she might have worn it. Uh, other, oh, there's a whole bunch of questions. I have to go first with the woman in the hat. Yeah, just because Marie Antoinette would have loved the straw hat. Yeah. I've heard that oh. one of her complaints when she was 14 and went to court mm -hmm. that she had problems with so many of the courtiers because they were illiterate. Is that the case? Oh, um, I've never heard that before, that she had problems because they were illiterate. No, I would say it's true, and, and, and it's amazing, I think, to, to, from our quite literate society and perspective, how illiterate a lot of these people were. But in fact, Marie Antoinette herself wasn't a particularly literate human being. She, um, 
because she was the 16th of 16 children born to Maria Theresa, her education had been quite neglected itself before she was tapped to become future Queen of France. And then she was, along with her extreme makeover, she was given a crash course in French history, French royal genealogy, which she seemed to like, and the French language. But her letters themselves are riddled with grammatical errors. She always spoke French with a, a German accent until the day she died. Uh, and she famously said, and this is, I'm a literature professor, so this is always a hard one for me given how much I actually actually do kind of love her, but she famously said that anybody who reads books is no friend of hers. She found it very boring. So I would not, I would not dispute the fact that other courtiers were illiterate, but I have not seen anywhere that um, Marie Antoinette herself had a complaint about that. She had plenty of other complaints about the, uh, about the courtiers and they about her, but the level of literacy was not one that I've seen. But I'd be interested to, see, to find out where you said that, because there's always... Millions of people, you know, so much has been written about her, and I spent years and years, and you'll see from the, the bibliography of my book, I consulted every source under the sun, but there are always ones that elude me. So if you can remember where you heard that, I'd love to take a look sometime. If it comes to you, maybe you can find uh, me. We have um, one right here. Yes, please. Oh, uh, well, once again, congratulations on the success of your book. Oh, thank it you so much. It is a professional librarian's dream. All right. Full of perfect research and reference. Okay. Thank you. Thank I have you. Two comments. We talked earlier about the... Um, and you alluded to it uh, with the uh, presentation and the imagery, the poofs. Yes. Uh, when I saw that show in New York, they oh. had what they call a grattoir, which was like a back scratcher, yes. which they used for... They did. It was called a scratcher, and it was, in fact, apparently an invention of Marie Antoinette's. And this is Dangerous Liaisons, this wonderful show that I was asked to show the uh, museum catalog. I, the only thing I didn't love about this show is the fact that there were no clothes from Marie Antoinette or right. really not much from her era in it because, again, so much was destroyed. But the grattoir, there are a few images showing women with poofs. And so it was, they played a little bit with that and historical chronology. The grattoir was designed and it was invented supposedly by Marie Antoinette's personal hairdresser, Monsieur Léonard, to itch the vermin down in your poof. Yes. Uh, <laughs> because you couldn't wash these things easily, as you might imagine from the look of them. And th yes, that did exist. And that was another luxury item that became a must-have item. It could be, often they were made out of gold or silver or mother of pearl. So it was another elegant item to have. And apparent, we don't, I don't know of any grattoir that belonged to her, but surely she had some. And the second is just a comment because the French, it seems, have invented everything, yeah. including the jeans that you alluded to, like a global costume yeah. for everybody in the world. Yeah. Do you know that originated oh, um, yes, in, in Denim, Denim, in, in, in France, yeah. Yeah. original fabric? Yeah, no, I know. Thank it's you. a French fabric. And I think Marie Antoinette would have, would have loved that because she really was a sort of an avatar of casual Friday in ways that we, we wouldn't necessarily know looking at her portraits now, but, but those registered as casual like blue jeans. Yes, please. Ha ha. My namesake. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you, you mentioned that there were about 2,000 courtesans living at Versailles yes. be, before she got, when she first got there. Yes. And but as, the, as it got closer to the revolution, was that still the case? They were actually resident? Oh, yeah. They, um, they yes. There were probably 2,000. Is, it's always, it's hard to tell because people weren't, you know, signing, you know, guest books or anything. But there were probably about 2,000 people living there at any given time. Up to 10,000 people could be in the palace on any given day because it was open to the public. It was always jammed with uh, visiting dignitaries and merchants and anybody could wander in. Um, but it's true, I think maybe what you're getting at is the fact that at, at, with, the, with the approach of the revolution, people did start fleeing France. Um, and that didn't, though, really start happening until s 1789, and even then it was only a small faction of, of people who fled, the, fled Versailles. Uh, in October of 1789, some of the most hated, Marie Antoinette's brother-in-law, her favorite brother-in-law, the Comte d'Artois, fled in the night on, um, in July 1789, as did Marie Antoinette's best friend, the Duchesse de Polignac. Those were the very early emigres. But most of the courtiers didn't start emigrating until fairly later on. With the, first, with the beginning of the revolution, it wasn't at all clear that the monarchy was going to topple. It was, OK, well, we have to sort of deal with these revolting people somehow. But um, people didn't anticipate that they were going to lose everything. And most of the court, Versailles, though, unfortunately, after October 1789, really became a ghost town because the whole court followed Marie Antoinette and her family back to the Tuileries in Paris. And there's this very beautiful and sad uh, memoir that talks about Louis XVI 
handing the keys of the front gate to some servant and saying, well, I guess you'll have to look after this now, kind of maybe anticipating that he might not ever see it again. But, but the numbers, as far as I know, between Marie Antoinette's arrival in 1770 and the revolution in 1789 didn't diminish so much. Uh, and the real wave of, of, of aristocratic emigrations didn't start happening until the 1790s um, when it was, it was clearer and clearer that the royalty uh, wasn't going to be able to exist uh, coexist peacefully with the revolutionary people. Uh, my second question is for uh, the Lebrun portraits and, and all of the, the revolutionary portraits. What's, is the Louvre the best museum in Paris to, uh, to see that? I think so. Yeah. I think the Louvre is the best for, for a lot of these portraits, but, but better still, I mean, most of these royal portraits are at um, the Museum of Versailles. And it's only a 15-minute ride from, from Paris. So anybody who really wants to see these portraits, definitely go to Versailles. They've just reopened the Petit Trianon after extensive renovations. It's beautiful to see. Um, and then in terms of revolutionary portraiture, the best place is the Musée Carnavalet, where they have her shoe. That's got the best revolutionary imagery, iconography. Really interesting counterpoints to this, the elegant Sèvres of the Ancien Régime is the very crude ceramic pottery of the revolution that have, you know, liberty or death painted all over it and the queen's head and, you know, blood dripping and guillotines. And it's great stuff. So for revolutionary paraphernalia, I recommend the Carnavalet. For, royal, for the royal portraiture, the Vigée stuff, most of it's actually the best of them are at, at Versailles, but the Louvre is, is you, can't, you can't beat either. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think we'll take one more question okay. so you can get to your book signing. Okay, of then... course. Yes, yes. Do you want to just carry the microphone to whoever? Who had questions? Did you have a question? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, those of you who still have questions, please come find me at the signing. Yes, please. I was just going to ask, what happened to the kids after... Oh, you know, people always want to know what happened to the kids, and it's a really sad story. Um, two of her children died before the revolution. The baby who was painted out of that painting, uh, her oldest son died in 1789 with the opening of the Estates General. It wasn't cause and effect, but he died just literally at the start of the revolution. She was sent to prison with her husband, her sister-in-law, and her two remaining children, her oldest daughter and her youngest son. Um, her oldest daughter was the only member of that family to come out of prison alive. And she was kept in prison until 1795, so two years after her parents were killed. Her aunt, the Louis the Sixteenth sister-in-law, was, was killed, I think, in that year, a little bit later. She didn't know where they had gone. She wasn't sure they were dead. Nobody had bothered to tell her, so she pretty much languished alone in jail. Uh, and her brother, though, uh, it's a much worse story. And so she survived. She wound up connecting with her uncle's families who had all emigrated across the border, and she wound up marrying Marie Antoinette's favorite brother-in-law's son, so her cousin, and they were restored to power. Marie Antoinette's brother-in-law became Charles X during the Bourbon Restoration, so she was restored to a position of grandeur, but she never really recovered from it. She wrote very, um, very touching because very shell-shocked memoirs about her time in prison that are a, a source for all of us biographers, um, just like Today they paraded my mom's best friend's head on a pike outside of our window. Like today, you know, we didn't have any fire in the fireplace. So they're very bland and they're scary in their blandness in terms of how much she lived through. The son is even worse. Um, he, because after Louis the Sixteenth was executed in January of 1793, he was technically the king of France. If you still believed in the monarchy, which plenty of people still secretly did. Uh, the revolutionary government were afraid of somebody trying to restore him to the throne, so they took him from Marie Antoinette and her daughter and her sister-in-law. They put him in a separate part of the prison. Uh, the first thing they did, apparently, was dress him in revolutionary clothes, which I talk about a bit in the book, and how they trained him to insult his mother and scream insults against the royalty across the courtyard from the prison. But then he disappeared, and it's thought that um, he was either murdered or starved to death, or, or a few historians have actually hypothesized that he was um, walled in alive into a cell and never never came out. So, Because the revolutionaries, I mean, I think it's horrible, of course it's horrible, but the revolutionary logic was we can't afford to have any last living trace of the royal family left who could accede to the throne. Uh, and they couldn't do anything about the princes who had already escaped across the border. Okay, Carrie's going to go over to the bookshop and the museum for the book signing. Um, but thank you all for coming thank here. You thank you for your for attention.